Senator from New York City, our first ever live audience show. Live audience, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Woo, yes. <laughs> Thrilled to be hosted by the Foundation Center. And I'm glad you're with me. You know it's live because the music is playing when it shouldn't be. I'm glad you're with me. I'd be stricken with glossophobia if you told me that you missed today's live audience show. Foundations as a tool for collective power. We're kicking off Foundation Center Month on Nonprofit Radio. My guests are Brad Smith, Foundation Center President, and Ana Marie Arhelagos, President and CEO of Hispanics in Philanthropy. We'll find out what the Foundation Center offers for small and mid-sized nonprofits, what trends our panel sees, how foundations can help our country come together at a time of considerable division, and we'll be taking questions from our audiences. Our guests also include our studio audience. Thank you again for being here, coming live to the studio. And of course, our YouTube audience. Hello, YouTube. We've got a bunch of people on the live stream, and we'll be taking questions from them as well. I've got giveaways. There's going to be prizes, giveaways at the end. Keep your phone handy. I know when is it never not handy, but, um, but don't be answering email during nonprofit radio. You don't want to be doing that or texting. But keep your phone around. You're going to need it to, uh, to win later on. On Tony's Take Two, I'll talk more about Foundation Center Month. We're sponsored by Pursuant, full-service fundraising, data-driven, and technology-enabled. Tony.ma slash Pursuant. Wegner CPAs, guiding you beyond the numbers, WegnerCPAs.com. By Telos, turning credit card processing into your passive revenue stream. Tony.ma slash Tony Telos. And by text to give mobile donations made easy, Text NPR to 444-999. But don't do that right now. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm really, I'm excited that uh, Brad and uh, Anna Marie are our first guests for uh, Foundation Center Month and our first live audiences. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Pleasure. Let me uh, give them the formal introduction. Bradford K. Smith devoted his entire career to the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors. He joined Foundation Center as president in October 2008. When the Foundation Center snatched him up, he was president of the Oak Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland, a major family foundation with programs and grant making in 41 countries. He led the Ford Foundation's Peace and Justice, Peace and Social Justice Program, their largest program area, distributing hundreds of millions of dollars to organizations working in human rights, international cooperation, governance, and civil society in the US and around the world. Foundation Center is at foundationcenter.org and at FDN Center. Anna Marie Arhelagos has a successful track record working within the public and nonprofit sectors. She joined Hispanics in Philanthropy as president in January. She's guiding HIP with a bold vision to usher in a new generation of philanthropy that is by and for and about the Latino community. She was a senior advisor at the Ford Foundation as, as well. Did you know each other at the Ford Foundation? No. You did not. But you come together. Destiny brought you to nonprofit radio together, seated next together. Um, at the Ford Foundation, she was part of the Equitable Development Team. Her work focused on urban development strategies to reduce poverty, expand economic opportunity, and advance sustainability across the world. She served as Deputy Chief of Staff and Deputy Assistant Secretary at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. She was a Senior Program Officer at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, where she spearheaded the foundation's work in rural areas, indigenous communities, and the U.S.-Mexico border region. Hispanics in Philanthropy is at hiponline.org, and she's at am underscore arilagos. But she left out the most important part. Of what I live out? Which I got from her. What I live out? I am a proud board member of the Foundation Oh, that's not it? Yes, Foundation Center board member. Oh, well, she should be sitting close to me then. So close to, uh, board members have to be our special, special treatment. Um, so Brad, let's start with you. Uh, uh, let's please acquaint people with the, the, the Foundation Center. I mean, there's so much going on here. Data and research, the directory, the, the excellent programs that are often free. Acquaint us with what's going on here. Yeah, uh, we do a lot. So there's a very long answer to this question and there's a very short answer. The very short answer Somewhere is- Somewhere in the middle. Is basically what Bloomberg does for the financial sector, we do for the social sector. We capture the data about what foundations do in America and around the world, their assets, their program priorities, 
um, what kind of grants they make, who they make the grants to, what the grants are for, where the grants are located, where the beneficiaries are located. We capture this data, we code it, we clean it, we process it, and we put it out in all sorts of different ways for nonprofit organizations, for foundations, for researchers, for consultants, and for journalists. Um, some of the major consumers of information are nonprofits. And you may say, why in the era of the internet do we need to have all this information? Can't we just Google it? Well, it actually turns out that more than 90% um, of foundations do not have websites. So you can't find them if you Google them. So the Foundation Center takes the tax returns and other data from all the foundations in the US. There's about 87,000 foundations in the US, many more around the world. Uh, we put all that out in searchable databases and tools, the biggest being Foundation Directory Online. And these serve as fundraising research tools for nonprofits. Foundation Directory Online is heavily used by large nonprofits, universities, um, YMCAs, for example, Red Cross, organizations like that, but also medium and smaller sized nonprofits. And it's also available for free uh, around the country um, at physical locations as part of something called a funding information network. Yeah. These are largely yeah, there are libraries throughout the country, right? That libraries, can, community foundations, other community-based organizations. And people can walk in and get instruction on using the, the directory. They're it's all staffed by a real live person, which, which I know is kind of an anachronism in today's world, but there's actually a real person there, not just a screen, um, who will help you do your search to see what foundations might possibly fund your dream. So that's one big audience for our information. The other big audience actually is foundations themselves. Um, foundations are endowed institutions. They have a lot of privileges because they're endowed. They're not selling things in the market. They're not raising money. They're not out kissing babies to get votes. But they all, because, because of all those things, they're somewhat isolated. So it's very difficult for foundations to answer two basic questions. And those two questions are, who's doing what where? And how can I know what other foundations already know about my issue area? And we help answer those questions. For any issue, be it climate change, at-risk youth, uh, racial equity, whatever you can think of, the Foundation Center can actually tell you what all the foundations are doing about that issue and who their partners are um, in this country and increasingly anywhere in the world. And we can also tell you what other foundations have already learned about what works and what doesn't work in working on some of the major problems that face our society. So those are some of the things we do. We do a lot more. We're a very busy organization. The programs. Talk about the, the programs here in the... The programs here, the yes. Office. We're, we're sitting at, we're sitting here in the Clark Training Annex of the Foundation Center at 32 Old Slip. Uh, we offer a full program of training. It is both fee and fee-based training and special events. That training curriculum focuses on proposal writing, fundraising research, how to get grants from foundations, how to get corporate sponsorships. We have a very popular series of classes called the uh, Proposal Writing Boot Camp, where you come in and you spend three days in a full room with other nonprofits, and you walk out with a letter of intent and a proposal that is ready to send to a foundation, and you learn how to do it along the way. We have a lot of special events too. Increasingly, you know, our sector's changing. So we find that nonprofits have lots and lots of new questions and new needs. So really, you know, what do I do? What's the best way to deal with social media? How do I maintain my reputation um, in a very volatile, contentious public sphere? Um, how do I work with millennials? That's a favorite topic actually. How do I actually approach a foundation? Um, those kinds of, we have a lot of special events where we bring in people who are experts in these fields uh, to talk to people, and these are largely free events. So we have some fee-based, some free events, and then we have lots and lots of free online tools. Two really popular websites, one called um, Grant Space, which has enormous amount of information for nonprofits on how to get grants, and another one um, called Grant Craft, which is actually for foundations and foundation professionals. Um, it's a, you know, working at foundations is a very interesting. I did it for much of my life, um, you know, as did um, Anna Marie. And you know, neither one of us went to college to get a degree in being a philanthropoid or being a foundation person. Um, it's a very large industry in the US. Foundations have over $800 billion in assets. They have about $62 billion a year. 
There's over 7,000 program officers and foundations, but there's nowhere you can go to actually learn how to become a program officer. You learn it on the job. So what GrantCraft does is it curates practical information from people who are actually doing the work and then makes it available to the whole of the field. And that's a part of Grant Space. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's GrantCraft. That's GrantCraft. Yeah. And okay. these, the, the programs you have live here, I'm, through the years, I've spoken at probably a dozen of them yeah. on none of the topics you mentioned, actually. I know. Plan, but fundraising, plans given. Um, it, it's, a, it's just a, an enormous resource, for, not only for the city, but now, I mean, now a lot of the programs are, uh, are streamed live, yeah. so you don't have to be local uh, to participate and to learn from the live programs that you've Yeah, and we actually got. have our own physical locations, our own field offices, which are regional offices in Atlanta, D.C., Cleveland, and New York, where we, uh, and San Francisco, where we run you know, similar programs. So, you know, these are tremendously valuable, and they're also very valuable to us because um, I'm constantly amazed by the people and the causes that come in the front doors of this organization. And what we find is a lot of the people that sign up for the free events are, are not, you know, it's not Harvard University, and it's not Planned Parenthood, and it's not the big nonprofits. These are people who are on the front lines dealing with some of the most difficult problems, and some of them are just creating their organization to fulfill their dream. And we're very proud of the fact that we can run our organization in a way where we can offer as much free information and free services to people who can't afford to pay for it. Now, I produce nonprofit radio, the, the podcast, for small and mid-sized shops. And I think Harvard and MIT could learn from the guests that, that I have on the show, but I know they're not, they're not listening. I'm producing it for the other 95%. Um, all right, let's, let's turn to uh, Anna Marie. Talk about uh, HIP, I mean, Hispanics and Philanthropy. You know, uh, in the in the in the current you know political environment, Latinos are are are, are bashed. I mean, it's you know it's 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 uh, it's shameful. A lot of the attention that that's directed the, the evil attention. So, you know, how are you? How has back this changed the, your uh, changed your work? And how are you elevating the, Latinos? Back in the '80s, when I first started my professional career working in a community organization, doing the mobilizing, we used to wonder how we could move the needle because Latinos were invisible. And we couldn't understand how to become visible and, and seeking some respect, dignity, and fairness. And now I'm like, whoa, those were good days being visible because yes, right now we're in the bullseye yeah. of the xenophobia, the racism, the scapegoating. It's very, very ugly. Brad, um, as a good board member, I'll say Brad often talks about the democratizing of data as part of like, the. that's the way I explain to my mom what Foundation Center is. Um, at Hispanics in Philanthropy, I think about it as democratizing philanthropy. So that philanthropy is not for us professional foundation, philanthropoids you called it, um, but that it's accessible to everyone. So that at Hispanics in Philanthropy, what we're doing as a network of foundations and philanthropists, and philanthropists are givers, Philanthropists are anybody like Stephanie, like Zora, like Aleida, my mom, my brother. Everybody can be a giver. And so what we're doing is complementing that kind of um, mentality. So it's not just the professionals, but also um, folks that want an on-ramp into investing in their communities and their infrastructure and their uh, institutions. And how do we do that? It's a new way of thinking about philanthropy so that it's complementing each other. And so that the power imbalances that you know very well um, yeah. between uh, foundations and the nonprofit um, organizations, the grassroots organizations that are on the ground, that so that there is some kind of a equity in that exchange because they're coming with resources and expertise which is just as valued. You've got something going on now, the, your civic participation grant yeah. program. Uh, I just started the, in January. Yeah. And this was one. Just in a few states, like just in five or six states. In right? the south. Um, and we've been working with our partners at the NCRP, Aaron Dorf, and the 
National Center for Responsive Philanthropy. Uh, thank you for doing that, because nonprofit radio, we have jargon jail. Yeah. And acronyms get you uh, jailed immediately. Well, but, that's, okay, thank you. But so NCRP, you shout out. out to their fantastic work on the South, looking at the um, incredible lack of equity in everything from access to education, to jobs, to housing. Uh, and all of this is really because of a lack of influence. And so the civic participation in the South, we're looking at states where you traditionally think of Latinos, Florida, Texas, the growing uh, community in North Carolina, but we're also looking at Louisiana, we're looking at Georgia, uh, states where we don't traditionally have Latinos but are very much magnets for Latinos right now. Mm -hmm. Georgia, in terms of absolute numbers, is the 10th largest uh, Latino population. Uh, and how do we make sure that there's an opportunity for them to have voice? Because at the end of the game, that's what it's about. We need voice and agency so that um, people are, are able to participate in the civic fabric. So Our schools don't teach civics anymore, and so what we're yeah. trying to do is recreate that civics. Um, what kinds of activities are you, are, are you I, I, know you, I don't know if it's right to ask what you're looking to fund, but what, what, to what level do you want people to be uh, active? Do you want, I mean, is it like voter roundups, uh, voter and, and voter registrations, or is it encouraging people to run for office, or all of that, or? You know, one of the problems is that we only think of civic participation as voting, and voting is very important, but I would say it's a proxy for civic participation, just one proxy. Being counted as part of the census is another. But really being, going to PTA meetings, being involved in your community in ways that affect you every single day, a, a lot, it's year round on a lot of different topics. Um, so the voting is the one that gets attention, but no, we're encouraging uh, year round engagement with your whatever, is the process, is it about the park, is it about the school, is it about access to health, is it how do we get better jobs? So that's what we're encouraging. Why is, why is there a reluctance to, to be civically engaged in the Latino community? There's, well, right now, there's um, so much mistrust in the system. Uh, you have people, people are locking themselves in the houses and, um, and um, not going out. I mean, you, uh, in Washington, D.C., I just read a Washington Post article where folks are going to um, renew their passports and they're instead sent to deportation <laughs> proceedings because their birth certificates are, even though they've had a passport for 20, 30, 40 years, right, there, there's a lot of, um, of, what do you call it, of mistrust <laughs> in the system. Uh, people who are residents um, permanent legal lawful residents um, are also not being, um, they go to naturalize and they're instead sent into deportation proceedings. What I saw uh, last month when I took a group of 55 uh, funders to the border to San Diego uh, was people who are coming in applying for political asylum they're, they're doing it the right way, the, with the papers, they're coming from places that are war-torn, um, they're not economic refugees, they're political refugees, and they're being sent into um, the next day without access to a lawyer or anything, they're being then um, sent back yeah. home. Um, so yeah. things are, are changing, yeah. and there's no playbook because we've never, or at least in our lifetimes, um, we haven't lived through here. So what HIP is trying to do is provide that real-time information. It's a lot of what we do. Uh, that's why we took funders to the border region. We took them, by the way, not to Texas, um, but to a place like San Diego and Tijuana, so that people could see that it's not just Central Americans and Mexicans that are coming, that are getting affected through the system, but there's huge tent cities with thousands of Haitians. There's thousands of people from Africa, from Nepal, from India, Venezuela, um, Brazilians that are coming and that are trying to navigate the the systems which are not written anymore. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of discretion in how officials are dealing with it. And so, 
that requires real-time learning from the program officers, from the philanthropists who are making decisions on their investment strategies. So that's one of the things that we try to do is providing that real-time learning so that they can um, get that knowledge, but also coordinate their investments with others. We also prov uh, develop funds. So right now we have a fund um, on the family separation crisis, on Families First, <coughs> um, in addition to the mini-grant programs that you referred to, which is the civic engagement in the South. Yeah, so we have lots of different things running. And also we offer on-ramps. I started the conversation by saying, how can you, you, and you be a giver. So we have uh, the first and only um, bilingual crowdfunding platform in the Americas, which is Hip Give. So if you're a grassroots organization and you don't have a development person, um, we can we provide the capacity and the opportunity you through this platform for you to be able to uh, make yourself visible and and, and raise yeah. funds. I want, to, I want to turn to Brad. Uh, uh, I propose an the, amendment to the, the acronym jail thing. I think J jargon jail? Uh, jargon jail. I think we have to give a, a pass for HIP. HIP is oh, well, the HIP, best no, that's understood. acronym that, yeah, well, that's that HIP, ever where came I, up with. I introduced her as, uh, as uh, HIP. president and CEO of, okay. of uh, Hispanics and Philanthropy. That one's understood. I but NCRP, okay. NCRP <laughs> is not as widely known. No, come on. Um, all right, so you have all this... Uh, is this trove of, of data yeah. research. Yeah. What, what are you seeing uh, trend-wise? Uh, what, what's 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 uh, what's growing in funding? Or yeah. and I'm also interested in what areas you might feel are are not getting attention that uh, that may need it. Yeah, the, the the data is really powerful because um, not only do we have it, but we're able to geolocate it, which means you can see it on a map. So you can search, you know, a mapping platform by an issue. For example, let's say you know you want to understand what philanthropy is doing for Hispanics and Latinos. You can search it for by beneficiary group, or you can search it by what is how is philanthropy benefiting Hispanic and Latino populations um, in basic education. You can then filter a subject and a population group, where you can see it. So it allows you to actually spatially also and visually see you know the gaps. If if you were to do uh, sort of a survey in a, virtually any country in the world, um, and there are forms of philanthropy in, in most all countries, you would find that the, the two biggest issue areas that get funding are education and health. Um, this is true universally. I think it's true for lots of good reasons. Um, the good reasons are that there's you know very good research and very good data that shows that the highest returns on investment in terms of social mobility and education and equality is, is for education. Um, so that's a good reason to be funding education. But it's also for reasons which I think are, are somewhat less impact driven and they have to do with alma maters. You know, people t tend to give money to their alma maters. And they, the fundraising departments of large universities are very good at reaching out to the people that, that went to yeah. them and, and getting gifts from them. Health, I think also because uh, health is something that affects us all, um, and it affects us in very personal ways. So you often find that philanthropists will tend to want to fund uh, uh, health institutions and subjects within health, specific disease, for example, cancer, because of a very personal history, because of a family member, because of a friend, maybe because of their own life. They were personally, you know, they were touched by a disease and they were helped by an institution and they want to give money to that. So there's a lot of money that goes to health and education. When you get outside of that, um, it, the money tends to be scattered over very large issue areas. Um, by and large, the, the, the toughest, most controversial sort of social justice issues tend to get the less money um, because they are divisive. There isn't agreement. They are controversial. Um, and there's some interesting trends developing that we're beginning to see that I think have a lot to do with the moment we're living in. Um, one is uh, sort of the creation of kind of emergency funds. Uh, foundations, uh, especially in this country after the, the most recent you know, national elections, um, and a lot of the really harsh rhetoric that was used during the campaign and the fear that existed after the election 
Um, I mean, excuse me. I mean, even for Latinos, I mean, it, you know, uh, Trump's uh, announcement in uh, in Trump Tower coming down the, right after he came down the escalator. Who did he single out? Mexicans, right? They're presenting as rapists and murderers. Uh, oh, and there's there's probably some good people too. Yeah, and I think you know it affected just you know within our own institutions. I mean, I remember we were you know when the talk of the Muslim ban came out. Um, we have Muslim staff members, and we sought legal counsel uh, because we had people asking us questions. Well, you know, I have vacation. Can I leave the country? You know, will I be able to get back in? Yeah. So we we wanted to make sure we understood actually what the legal parameters were so that we could best support so, our staff. So you feel like social justice is not getting the funding it needs? Well, it's getting this kind of emergency. But what worries me about it is... But that's the, all ad hoc Well, it's I, and reactive. I, I think it's coming for good reasons. Um, you know, foundations don't operate in a vacuum. Foundations have constituencies. And uh, the constituencies of the foundations, which are their grantee partners, were coming to them and say, we need support. You know, our be it HIP, be it uh, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, all the different kinds of rights organizations out there, the groups that work with, with immigrants, for example, they were tremendously um, scared of the new situation. How are we best going to serve our population that's in need? So I think it was an understandable and a good response of foundation to say, we're going to create special funds to do this. What worries me about it is that if you... You know, it's, it's funny, right, uh, leading up to the elections and after the elections, I was doing a lot of speaking around the world, and I was speaking on the topic of the role of philanthropy in an illiberal world. And the notion of illiberal was actually coined by um, Fareed Zakaria in the 90s when he was looking at the growing phenomenon of, gov of democratically elected governments around the world that were behaving in undemocratic or Ill illiberal ways without respects for constitutions, for basic rights, et cetera. And this was always something that, you know, sort of comfortably U.S. analysts saw happening somewhere else, but not in the U.S. And what we're seeing is it's happening in Europe, it's happening in the United States, it's happening in large swaths of the world where you have elected leaders that are sort of changing the way, the, the game for, for democracy. Um, and one of the things that I was talking about in these speeches is that um, this is not an isolated phenomenon in one country. This is a global phenomenon. And the solution is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And it's being driven by real issues that I think all of us were not paying enough attention to. We were not paying enough attention to the long-term effects of globalization, which created income concentration at the top of the society around the world. The fact that traditional working classes around the world were seeing their jobs being displaced. And this incredible flow of people around the world that produces a very convenient supply of state goods. You know, we're seeing this all over in industrial countries. The people that look different, that talk different languages, you know, that's the problem. You know, that's why we don't have jobs. That's why we don't have wage growth. Get going, yeah. I have, to, I have yeah. to stop you for a minute because uh, I have to do a little business because we're funded. Uh, and I promised the audience that we were going to have questions. Uh, I had said both both halves. Right after I do a little business here and uh, talk a little about our sponsors, um, we're going to questions. So you got like three minutes or so to think of your question. Okay. Um, the first is uh, Pursuant, and their new ebook is Fast Nonprofit Growth: Stealing from the Startups. They take secrets from the fastest growing startups and apply those methods and practices to your nonprofit. It's free, as all their resources are. It's on the listener landing page, and that's at tony.ma slash pursuant, with a capital P. Regner CPAs, they have something on their blog that may interest you. It's new revenue recognition standard. Will it impact me? OK, not the sexiest, uh, like most click candy-ish title that you've ever seen on the web. But that's because they're CPAs, right? Their heads are in the tax code, where you want, C you want your CPA's heads to be in the tax codes, federal and state. So they're where they belong. Uh, it's a new, this wide sweeping rule about uh, contributions and how you account for them, categorize them. You'll find that at regnercpas.com. You click resources, then you click blog. Telos, credit card processing. I've, uh, I've read in the past testimonials from nonprofits that have referred businesses 
Uh, and those organizations are getting a long tail of passive revenue month after month. I've read testimonials from those businesses that are using Telos for their credit card processing. They love it. Um, think of family businesses. Think of board member businesses. Think of businesses in your community that are already supporting you. You can refer them. The way to get started is watch the video. It's at the listener landing page, tony.ma slash Tony Telos. And text to give. You'll get more revenue because text to give makes giving easy. It's if your donors can send a text, they can make a donation to you. It's simple, affordable, it's secure. I've talked to the CEO, Chad Boyd. He's a very smart guy who's built a very smart company. If you text NPR to 444-999, you'll get the info and you can claim a nonprofit radio listener offer. It's time now for Tony's take two. And I want to talk more about Foundation Center Month. So we're just, this is just the kickoff. This is the first of four. All the September shows in, uh, of Nonprofit Radio are going to be here at the Foundation Center live. I'm very grateful to Brad and his team. for We've been working on this since January to put together a month of shows here at the Foundation Center. Uh, as I said, it's our first time studio audiences taking live questions, first time doing that. because This is a podcast. So people listen a couple days after I record it, after, you know, my message after I record, after it's published, uh, a month after it's published, and you typically get very little feedback from the podcast audience. So we've got over 13,000 listeners, but I get precious little feedback. But I know they're there because I see the stats. Um, so I know people are listening and downloading and listening. Um, so this is a great opportunity, and we're going to transition to that uh, right this minute. So now it's time for the listener questions to the audience questions. Who's got a question? We've got a microphone. Who has a question for me or Brad or Anna Marie? Question. OK, here's a question up front. Tracy's coming up with a microphone. So you will be, you will be heard. Our first one, our brave first questioner on nonprofit radio. It always takes one. And then there'll be six after that. You'll see. Thank you. Happy to warm everybody up. My name is Sam. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the work that you do, but I'm curious about which projects or initiatives at your respective institutions you're most excited about right now, and maybe reflect how that sort of maps onto this narrative about the great political divide. What most excites you? Anna Marie, you want to start? Very hard. Um, I'll give you two examples if you allow me. Um, one is based on the civic participation in the South very worthy and important, but it's also a test for us at HIP by doing the civic participation in a smaller geography, one where I would say um, there's a deep urgency. I'm trying to test the hypothesis that this is something that we should be doing broader. Um, so I'll be watching to see how this works, and if it works well, um, you could expect that to, to go broader. Um, I'm also really excited about our work on leadership and leadership development because we're working with uh, trustees at foundations and they, although when you think about people who are trustees and you think about them as being accomplished people, brilliant, um, you don't think about them as needing tools or support or or help in articulating a message. I, I, I've been in a lot of board meetings where I could see the need for support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and what I've see, what I saw in the first six months as I was going around the country as a listening tour, I was getting lots of folks that were either new in philanthropy because, as you said, folk there's not a course that you take um, that were trying to figure out how to get more connected to others like them. But I saw an overrepresentation of uh, trustees that wanted to understand what trustees in other parts of the country were doing, especially because right now um, there's they often feel a little bit lonely in that they articulate a message and there's not enough people of color um, in the boardrooms often, uh, not at Foundation Center. Um, and so they want to be able to understand how they do this from a position of power. Uh, with people that have very different li lived experience. 
So that's lots of fun. Yeah. Our work around NGEN with uh, Latino leaders that are mid-career folks in right, philanthropy. We said two. We said two. You brought it. You brought it, Darren. Um, one that directly relates to the sort of what you call the great political divide. I think it's what you called. Um, the Foundation Center has, uh, we have lots of websites that are based on issues. And one is actually um, about foundation funding for US democracy. Um, it can be found at democracy.foundationcenter.org. And this is a, a data visualization site that allows you to see the, the many different ways that foundations across the country are investing actually in the functioning of the democratic system itself. Things like um, campaign finance, uh, voter, voter participation, government rules and regulation, regulations, accountability. Uh, and it gives you an overview. You can write down to individual grants and you can see what foundations are doing. And foundations have different views on this. This is not a partisan site. Um, it basically gives you the data so you can understand what, what foundations are doing. So that's one of the things I think directly relates to what you're talking about. The other thing I'm really excited about is actually a technology thing, which is totally geeky. And that's because uh, one of the big problems with the information for the nonprofit and foundation sector is it's based largely on tax returns called 990s, the kind of things that the, the most people know. Yeah, the I accountants think our, our that you talk about to help help you prepare, right? Wagner the CPAs, CPAs right? Wagner right. CPAs, yeah. right? Um, and that revenue recognition comes in handy on those 990s. The the problem with 990s is that they're filed by nonprofits that go to the Internal Revenue Service. Um, the ones that are electronically filed are finally now, as of 2016, being released as electronic open data. They were not before. They were released as image files. Um, and the ones that are uh, filed as physical documents are still being released as physical documents. There's a tremendous time lag between when an organization finishes its fiscal year they have up to a year to fill it out. It goes to the IRS. It takes time to get from the IRS to public access. And then it takes time for organizations like ours or our partners, GuideStar, to actually do something with that data. So we're dealing with information about the sector that is based on what was happening in the sector as many, many as three or four years ago. So we're involved in a project which is basically taking real-time flows of information we're looking at downloading a million news stories a day. Um, we're looking at over 120,000 social media feeds of nonprofit organizations and using machine learning techniques and data science techniques to basically pull out from that huge torrent of information anything that's philanthropy related. Uh, individual gift, the name of a person, an organization, a person, a subject, a a location. Can we can we see anything about this project Not online yet. yet? No. No, this is right. preview of coming attractions. Right. But All we're right. beginning we're we're gonna we begin to put this information into our products, our thematic based websites, so you'll be able to see together with that more historic information what philanthropy is doing today. And our real goal is that, you know, if you know Anamari is really worried about um, for example, you know, the separation of immigrant children from their families and goes into our databases to search. Now, that's not gonna show up in the data that's three or four years ago, oh, because that's happened today. But we're beginning to pull in information that will show you exactly what the sector is doing about that issue today. All right. And we're very excited about that. Right. What I didn't say is that uh, each questioner actually uh, gets a candy. So I, I, I held that in abeyance. I wanted, I, I wanted, the, uh, wanted the, the first person to be uh, rewarded on, on, you know, to not know. And actually, you'll get two candies so, so catch both of these. Yes, all right. Do we have any questions from YouTube yet? No questions? Okay, YouTube audience, you're welcome to uh, comment and uh, ask your questions. Any, another question uh, right here in the audience? I can tell. You want to talk about Brad? Yes, and the not, work not that personal, he's doing. Uh, yeah, the data well, the, project. Let's keep it to well, the data the project. Well, the work that he's pushing forward has been incredibly powerful. For example, last year, almost to the day, we had Hurricane Maria. Uh, hit Puerto Rico, and it was by using his data really, really quickly and the data that was compiled by the folks at the Foundation Center that we were able to show, for example, that $5 million on average is what foundations from the mainland spend on Puerto Rico in, in any given year. 
um, that compared like that during a time when the island was going through debt restructuring. So it was something at the level of Detroit, but Detroit was receiving 250 million and the whole entire island was. Yeah. Uh, so we're able to show the disparities in terms of how different populations or geographies are, um, are receiving resources or not. And when you bring that kind of data to a foundation um, a representative, you're saying, it's not just what's happening here, but it's repeated all across the space of philanthropy, and this is a systems-wide issue. And then you're able to get people to say, oh, then we need to be a leader, we need to make that happen, we need to make change. And I'm um, gonna ask you about actually making that, nonprofits can do to try to make that change, and, and but I wanna see if there are any other questions. Anybody else? Anybody in the audience? No, uh, okay, please. Here, where you're up front, a mic is coming. See, it's that candy reward, I know, because without the candy, she wouldn't ask the question. I was going to say, I'm asking a question because I'm hungry. <laughs> um, oh, these are small candies. Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to ask because um, it's tough. I don't know what your answer might be, but y your Hard audience questions, is mostly small, no, medium groups yeah, like absolutely. us. We're a small startup nonprofit. Um, what kind of work? What kind of work do you do? It's first? called Core Africa. It's an African Peace Corps program. Right. Um, we actually have offices in Morocco, Senegal, Malawi, and we just opened in Rwanda. So we're expanding quickly. Okay. It's What's your question? Capacity. How do I mean? We are members of the Foundation Center. Um, I have sent out hundreds of LOIs proposals. Rarely do I get a response. Most of the time, the response is, "Sorry." Um, and I go back and ask why, and they say, we don't do that. Um, I think about fundraising with foundations, and what the words that come to mind are rejection, discouragement, and a word you used earlier was invisible. <laughs> um, how do we break through? What's your advice for organizations like us? I know the answer is capacity. I mean, fund fundraising is only one of the things that I do, and it's foundations are only one of the types of fundraising that we do. Um, I have 15 minutes a week for foundation fundraising. What's your advice? All right, so small and mid-sized. I mean, it's small, small organizations. Um, the, the time constraints, um, the rejection. What uh, what advice do you have? How do you how do you get heard? How do you get seen? How do you get attention? It's frustrating. Yeah. Well, I, uh, all right, yeah. I have. Uh, actually personal experience with that because I worked at foundations, right? So, and you know, it's the inverse problem when you work in a foundation. Um, yeah, I remember one year at the Ford Foundation, we, we decided to count everything that we could con possibly conceive of as a request, whether it was a full proposal or an email or a letter of intent or something. And there were 144,000 requests and in a year where we made 2,000 grants. So you spend the majority of your time as a program officer saying no. And even if you fight against it, you become very jaded and you become very automatic and you kind of you know, respond. So when I came here, of course, this is, this is a nonprofit organization, so we raise, we raise you know, money too. And I quickly thought, I really realized, well, this is like dating, with like, except it has like a much higher rejection rate. You know, it's like you get rejected many times every day. And we actually have a few rejection letters which are, I think they're form letters because they recommend that we actually <laughs> consult the foundation center and then they give us the address. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, I think that's also, I, there's no easy, we get that question all the time. I mean, you know, we teach that a grant begins with a relationship and it's really true. It's very hard to cold call foundations and get a grant. So we teach How do you open that relationship then? Yeah, we teach people at our fundraising boot camp that we do things like, you know, you, you map, you, you look at who's on that board. You look at the social networks, you look at their fa you know, Facebook, you looked at LinkedIn, you see if, do you know anybody who knows that person? You use databases to see, well, what other, what other organizations has this foundation given money to that I know? You know, can I get another organization to broker the contact? I mean, the thing is to somehow find a way to get through to a personal contact. You can sometimes through RFP request for proposals, things sometimes, you know, send in something and get something. You know, also the work you're doing is difficult. I mean, you know, a relatively small percentage of American foundation funding goes for work outside the United States. 
it's growing um, in terms of dollars, but the percentages have been reasonably stable. Um, most of it goes in the US. And then one of the countries you're working in, one is Francophone, right? Rwanda, right? Yeah. What? And Senegal, right. And you know, the, the bias even for Africa funding of US organizations is Anglophone Africa. Where you find the, the funders in, in Francophone Africa, they tend to be European funded, like Bel the King Baudouin Foundation from Belgium and whatnot. So, you know, what you're also doing is really tough. I mean, we do have, there's one website, I don't know if you've seen it, um, called equalfooting.org, that we produce for Bloomberg Philanthropies. And it's actually about all the funding that's going in from foundations into uh, Rwanda, um, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's a free public resource. All right. Anna Marie, you want to give some advice? Isn't there an SDG funders also? Well, what, what about the broader question about small nonprofits trying to get attention? I would agree because in the philanthropy. Well, we know we agree. It's, it's yeah, hard, but how do you it, how do you change it? How do you get no, the attention? It, it's really. It's like, I know it's like trying to date Harvard University. No, I, I would agree completely with Brad because um, it's based on relationships. But if it's relationships where it looks like you're pursuing, uh, the program officer will become will put up more potentially yeah. uh, barriers to create a safety. So I think that in my opinion, and there's an old adage of, if you want money, ask for, uh, ask for ideas, and if you ask for ideas, you probably will get money. It's, it's that. It's uh, going to it saying, hey, I know that you're overwhelmed with, res with the need for resources. What I need is help thinking through and get people invested in your work by asking them to not give you money and make it safe immediately. Um, and asking for ideas. All right, first of all, uh, here's, that's a hard, thank you for the hard question. She got it. Um, also, I will say, and this is, it, it may sound like shameless self-promotion, but it's actually shameless uh, self-cross-promotion, because I hosted it here at the Foundation Center. I think it was back in November, we hosted a panel, was it November, Tracy? Yeah, November, we hosted a panel of three grant makers and one uh, grant recipient, one nonprofit uh, doing grassroots work. And we, were, we devoted the hour or 90 minutes to that exact subject, how to build relationships with uh, grant makers, how to break through the noise, how to get attention. So you could, I know you can go to TonyMartinetti.com and search for Foundation Center and it will come up. Um, I don't know where you would, I don't know if you can find it on the Foundation I'm not trying to get all the views or something, but uh, I, I hosted the panel right here and it was, it, was, it was outstanding. It ranged from social media, to other, other forms of networking. Um, you know, really, it was just how to break through the noise. Do and it was 90 minutes devoted to that. Sometimes, I mean, don't ask for cash. Ask for ideas or ask, can we have a meeting in your office? Or uh, things like that that are not cash, but that are like at least get your name under their radar. What a, the advice thing is really important because um, I remember the years I was a program officer. Um, I, when organizations would actually treated me like a person that actually knew something and had ideas and not just an ATM machine, it was really flattering and it really worked and I really appreciated it. It was really nice being invited to be part, like, you know, be in a round table or speak about something I knew about. It could be, you know, let's, let's talk about philanthropy in Africa, talk about human rights in Africa or something like that. And that did, tend to establish relationships with, you know, many times did result in longer term grants and partnerships. So. You another question? All right, excellent. I gotta throw the candy to the third row, no problem. Um, my question relates to the um, technology advancements that you're making for information that we can search. Um, but other industries are way ahead of the nonprofit industry in using technology for efficiency. Like this whole discussion, rather than each small or medium sized nonprofit doing the same exercise of chasing money, is the foundation or other um, philanthropic organizations investigating how to bring technology efficiencies to the back office functions that we all have to go through. 
Well, when you say back office function, do you mean the grant the grant seeking functions or? Yeah, is, with technology, I mean, we should be able to fill out, say, a uniform type of grant request submitted to a database yeah. and. Yeah, okay, so we're we're focusing yeah. on that because I was just saying I mean, there's enormous amounts of cloud office technology, but but we were talking focusing on grants. Yeah, I mean, you know, so. I mean, there is Salesforce and all that. I mean, there is you know Blackbaud, and there are, there are things that the, the the nonprofit sector uses a lot in the back office. But what you're talking about is the the whole common grant application thing, which is like the common you know common application for universities. That's been tried in in many different parts of the of the U.S. and um, it started out as successful. And then what's happened is over time is that because remember foundations are endowed institutions, right? So they're they're very independent and idiosyncratic which also is the flip side of what gives them the freedom to do a lot of innovation. They tended to attach appendices. So you would have a common application, but then you know, each foundation would put like two or three appendices that were special to, you know, to its requirements. And over time, the common application became basically you know, a theme in, in, in 250 variations. I think what's different now is there's the beginning of explorations about how to use um, machine learning and the kind of systems you're talking about to pre-populate core information for grant proposals. So a nonprofit doesn't have to reproduce it, you know, 100 times for 100 applications. Um, again, I mentioned a partner of ours, GuideStar. GuideStar has a, a essentially a sort of a transparency seal program where you upload the core information about your organization, all the kind of stuff that would be requested. And it is possible then for foundations and others to grab that information from a single source rather than request it all the time. It's still not mainstream, but the possibility is being created. The other thing is um, we've run some experiments with large uh, competitions there was the MacArthur Foundation's 100 million and change. Um, they provided all the proposals to us, and we used machine learning on those to basically sort them in all sorts of different ways, map them, and then try to begin to relate using technology features of the proposals to the, the likelihood of being approved or not. Brett, I, I want to get to a question on uh, YouTube. Now, we cannot provide a candy to, to our YouTube uh, listeners, viewers. But we certainly can here. And uh, we only just have like two more minutes or so. So what's the question from? Uh, a statement YouTube. on YouTube from AmeriCorps Vista. Um, they want to say these are very good questions, um, particularly the one posed by Core Africa Peace Corps. And uh, they do have a question for you, Tony. Do we get any candy? <laughs> I just, I see, I, I, I anticipated that question. And I even already just said uh, we cannot send candy to the uh, we can send eye candy. You got eye candy. Look at this panel. Yes. So the answer is yes. Oh, I, I revised my answer from what I said before. In anticipating your question, now I've thought through and I've decided yes, you have enormous candy. Look at this panel. So yes. All right. Cool. Uh, what do we have? Just like a minute or so left. All right. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start to wrap up. Uh, I want to warn you, uh, live audience and YouTube. Uh, YouTube giveaways also. Get your phone ready, poised. And uh, I want to thank our first live audience guests, of course, Brad Smith and Anna Marie Aurelagos uh, from the Foundation Center here in New York City and from uh, Hispanics in Philanthropy and uh, Anna Marie all the way from California. Do you get candy? We got water. We have a, have a pocket. Yes, you want, oh, so you're going to make it, you're going to make a spectacle out of this. Yes, look at this. Look at all the candy you're getting. Absolutely. Please join me, live audience, thanking them. All right, here's your chance. You need your phone. The first five people to text are going to win a copy of the book, which is called, which the title is Braided Threads, A Historical Overview of the Nonprofit Sector. All right, get your phones ready. Um, I had the author on the show just about uh, like two or three weeks ago, Dr. Robert Penna. It's sort of a, I mean, like how did we get here? How did, how did today's nonprofit sector evolve through history? Uh, and it's not a boring chronology, but he does start with Queen Elizabeth I, and he takes us through to you know, the uh, the outcomes movement, but not strictly chronological, 
How did religion play a part? Uh, how did the uh, Puritan settlers in the, uh, in the Northeast and settlers in the South, how did that evolve? Um, how did they contribute to what our sector looks like today? So the book is really cool. All right, so the number, you need the number. Of course, you need the number. Um, the number is 252-515. I can feel the tension in the room. And I, I, feel it, I feel it coming through uh, YouTube. 7987, 252-515-7987. As I said, Dr. Robert Penny was a guest just a couple weeks ago. If you go to TonyMartinetti.com and you look up uh, Penna, P-E-N-N-A, of course, you'll find him. He'll pop up. And what are you texting? Okay, the first five people to text are going to win a copy of the book. You text NPR. NPR, November Papa Romeo, NPR for nonprofit radio. Text it, the first five people win the book. Of course, it's all automated, so I have no idea who the winners are. Congratulations to the, to the, uh, to the five people who have won, whether you're live streaming with us on YouTube or whether you're right here. Next week, we're going to be back at the Foundation Center. We're talking about community foundations. Again, we've got someone from the uh, Foundation Center, and uh, we've got uh, a panelist from the Brooklyn Community Foundation. Foundation, community foundations, how are they different? How do you approach them? And we're also going to talk about donor-advised funds. Very provocative. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, I love that panel reaction. Yes. Um, if you missed any part of today's show, just remember, this is a podcast, so I have to, I have to accommodate the, uh, the 13,000 podcast listeners. If you missed any part of today's show, I beseech you. Find it on TonyMartinetti.com. We're sponsored by Pursuant, online tools for small and mid-sized nonprofits, data-driven and technology-enabled. Tony.ma slash Pursuant, capital P. Wegner CPAs, guiding you beyond the numbers. WegnerCPAs.com. By Telos, credit card and payment processing, your passive revenue stream. Tony.ma slash Tony Telos. And by Text to Give, mobile donations made easy. Text NPR to 444 999. That one you could do that. You can do that now. Our creative producer is Claire Meyerhoff. Sam Leibowitz is the line producer. The show's social media is by Susan Chavez. Mark Silverman is our web guy. This music is by Scott Stein of Brooklyn. Many thanks to Tracy Kaufman and Susan Sharoma here at the Foundation Center for working with me since January to bring this to fruition. Be with me next week for Nonprofit Radio. Big nonprofit ideas for the other 95%. Go out and be great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.